I told you that I realized in 2012 that I actually belonged in the lane next to one of the fastest women in the world. What would you think of me? Would you possibly name a, a special psychiatrist to have me go and talk to? <laughs> or would you listen to my story for a while to see if it possibly can make sense? Um, that's what I'd like you to explore in the, the talk that I'm gonna give today. And um, it seems absolutely crazy. How could someone who can't walk have something in common with someone who has won an Olympic medal? Um, to do that, I've gotta go back to the beginning. And obviously, probably everybody's wondering, obviously I can't walk, and where did that, how did that come about? And when did I uh, lose the ability to walk? Um, when I was four years old, um, my parents noticed I was tripping and stumbling and asked to be carried quite a lot more than um, another child would. And at first my mom had brought it up with a pediatrician, but he reassured her I was meeting all the normal neurological milestones for, for a little toddler and things seemed okay. Um, but then one day the teacher called from preschool and she said something really is wrong. Um, we noticed that Jill just watches other children when they run and I would trip a lot in the hall at school and I can still remember that falling so hard and kind of make a loud smack sound and I could feel the dust blow up into my nose and mouth and then I'd hear the teacher's high heel, shield, high heel shoes click 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 and she'd come and get me and have me hold her hand and walk in the front of the line and pretty soon she just always had me walk in the front of the line to avoid the tripping that would happen. Um, the twist in the story is that um, my dad had the same things happening to him in his early childhood years. And um, in that day, polio was very prevalent. So when doctors saw that he was walking this way, it's the early 50s, it makes sense, this must be polio. Um, we had no idea at the time ex the exact nature of our genetic disorder. My dad really didn't know growing up. He just went on with life. He decided to become an attorney and just uh, went forward with things. And if you look at the picture that I have of us um, sitting outside by a swimming pool, if you look closely at my dad, we actually will learn along this journey, we actually are a blend of two genetic disorders. And just like you looked at the previous slide, do you see a rabbit or do you see a duck? Um, most neurologists just look at muscle. So that's very obvious. You walk with a waddle, um, you can tell there's a muscle disease. However, and it's incredibly difficult to see in a man, we also had a disorder of body fat development. And so if you look closely at the same picture, kind of look um, from the area of the shoulders upward, you can see body fat spilled out a little bit more in my dad. But when you look below the line, you see kind of this line of, it's not congruent. Kind of takes a little imagination, but definitely not the first thing that a neurologist would notice. Um, but I want you to keep that picture in mind because um, it'll be important as I, as I go on. So, um, but basically, um, I kind of got the tripping thing under control, at least mostly, and went on to do things like ride a bike and roller skate. And one of my favorite memories in elementary school was that we would play Red Rover. And I was terrified of that game. And, <laughs> there'd, you know, we all knew the rules and everything, and there'd um, always be some new kid that would join the class, and they'd look and they'd go, Oh, that's where I'm gonna run, because I had these little itty bitty arms. And um, what I loved about an elementary school is we never had the counselor come or the nurse or a teacher and talk about what was wrong with me. The kids, we all just looked out for how to play the rules. And I'd see the new guy, a couple guys in my class would go off walking with him for a few minutes and he'd come back and I began to realize they'd have the talk with him that you can't red rover her. And so that's one of my favorite memories because I got to hold everybody's hands, but I didn't have somebody race. <laughs> so as you can see, especially as a girl, this problem that I touched on about body fat development was becoming more obvious by 11. It's a picture of me at 11. And you're probably thinking, you know, where are you going to get medical help? Are they going to figure this out? And every summer my family would go to the Mayo Clinic. And by the time I got to this age, I was frustrated with just seeing neurologists and I wanted to go see the body fat doctor, which I didn't understand the terminology at the time. I wanted to see an endocrinologist. Um, but my doctor was not impressed with this idea and he just said the words nobody likes to hear from the neurologist, it's just your muscle disease. 
and I didn't get a referral. He said, you just simply don't have enough muscle um, to, my veins would show too, which was another troubling symptom. And his explanation was, well, you just don't have enough muscle to cover those, cover your veins. Um, so you're probably wondering, well, you know, you've come so far and we've gotten to this exciting development that we're going to learn about. Where's this mecca of medical understanding? Tell me, I'd like to know, where can you go? The best diagnosticians, they will get it right every time. They will even be Mayo Clinic neurologists and they are junior high girls. They can spot what's out of place if your eyes are too close together, if you're too far apart, if you walk funny, if your ears are too high in your head, ask a junior high girl if they are masters at this. So um, I was frustrated with middle, middle school, just didn't have a lot of answers. Um, so as I went on in life, I decided by the time I got to college, I wanted to study genetics for myself. So I thought if nobody's going to come in and tell me the answers, I'd like to go out and discover for myself. And I did know I had a type of muscular dystrophy. What a neurologist can do is draw a sample of blood, and they'll see an enzyme that normally should be in your muscles. And when there's muscle injury or a disease process, it leaks out into the bloodstream. So when you find an elevation of that, that's usually a pretty good indicator that um, someone has muscular dystrophy. But even seeing the top geneticists at the Mayo Clinic, um, which actually is, is a fair thing to say. They said, we just don't know what this is. And they really have not seen a family like ours. So um, went off to college and studied genetics and eventually found pictures of people with Emory Dreyfus muscular dystrophy. And it's just an instant recognition, just like recognizing family. In a photograph, I could see details of mostly in the photographs, but then reading about the condition. And I realized this is what I have. Um, the curious thing is the most tangible clue I can give to you on how do you recognize somebody with Emory Dreyfus. Um, if you've ever handled a Barbie doll, you notice there's some characteristics with the Barbie doll. Um, Barbie can't bend her shin down to her chest. Um, Barbie's arms don't straighten, they're always bent a little bit. And she's up on her tiptoes like she's ready to put her foot in a high heeled shoe. And those are called contractures, it's where you don't have full length and function of a particular muscle group. So I like to say, you know, with all this confusion finding this rare muscle disease, if uh, those educating medical students could just put a Barbie up on the podium, <laughs> and you could just don't forget it when you see it again. So, um, of course, the biggest issue that was looming as I got to college age were questions about the future, having children, you know, it was a huge question for me. And um, when I participated in a summer internship, um, I had two really great people in my life kind of bend the rules or literally break them for me, um, a doctor and his son who was a graduate student. And um, I went to a medical clinic, had some blood drawn, and the doctor came out in the lobby and had one of those nondescript paper bags, and he said, here, take two of these, call me in the morning. Well, he had let me walk out with my uh, vial of blood that he'd drawn. And his son, a graduate student, took that over to the laboratory late at night when no one was there. And I watched out my window and saw him snap on the light to the lab. And he isolated my DNA in the night hours because obviously this is highly not allowed. But <laughs> <laughs> So <laughs> the next morning, I was pretty excited. Um, DNA is not very large and uses really, really tiny pieces of medical equipment. So he presented me with a test tube that was probably about three quarters of an inch tall. And in there was my DNA in liquid form. And, you know, I was just fascinated by it. You know, I think I wanted to control the uncontrollable. And it felt awesome to just hold this tube in my hand and think, wow, you know, there's three billion G's, A's, T's, and C's. And somewhere in here is this mutation that, you know, could potentially have a 50-50 chance of any a child of mine having, which is, so much to take in and process. And it felt good just to hold it in my hand for some reason. So as the summer winded down, I had this little tube I kept in my dorm room and I don't know how to explain it. I just really couldn't take it home with me for some reason that I didn't really understand. So as my car pulls honking outside, I've got just a few minutes left in the lab. I tried to write DNA and I got that on the top of the lid. And then I wanted to write my name because I just wanted to save this somehow in somebody's freezer. And I only could get room with the marker to write J-I for Jill and D-O for Doc. I thought, 
open it up, and I put it in a little tray in a freezer. And, you know, I think I just wanted to put it there because someday somebody might come sorting through all these test tubes and say, well, who is Jido? You know, <laughs> and I just wanted them to think about me a little bit. So, as it went on, I'll move through a lot quickly. Um, I actually found a group of Italian scientists looking for a second gene for Emory Dreyfus. They found one in cases going from mother to son. And when I wrote to them, they were thrilled because they only had four families in the entire world to work with at this point. And one was just showing up in the mail with photos and a description, and that was me. So it took, um, this was probably about 1996, and in this day and age, um, it took about four years to isolate a gene for a particular disease. So down the road, about four years later, I literally clicked into my email and there it was, they had found my mutation. Mm -hmm. So I didn't have a doctor explain it to me or you know anybody with me, I just clicked open. And out of those three billion G's, A's, T's, and C's, there was a single G that was changed to a C and that was it. Mm -hmm. And it was just a lot. I, don't regret it, I'm sure people would listen and think, there's no doctor, there's no genetic counselor, it's just you and your computer. But it simply was how it was, and then I realized what I had. And, uh, you know, wow, this is so much information. You know, I've read up on all these things. You know, um, I went out one evening with my brother Bob, and I'm like, there's just such exciting things they can do with DNA. They can, they can, you know, make a whole bunch of embryos, and they can check them, and they can see, well, which one has the gene, and which one has, the C and make a decision about all this. And he just listened really patiently and then he said, well, what if mom and dad would have done this? Mm. And both of us have the same disorder. And we both just really were quiet and just kind of sat together and took it all in. And um, I don't mean to say what is the answer, it's just an enormously complicated question. And um, the exciting things happened in my life a few years later, I met my husband. And um, ultimately, I ended up um, having my son, um, just a naturally conceived child. And, um, you know, I, I thought about it. I worked so hard for so many years to have the control to say, it's this G that got changed to this C, and now I know, and I can fix everything. And in the end, <coughs> I really just chose a child of fate, which I must say I'm so pleased and so incredibly happy that I have him. Um, so moving back to our story, there's some exciting twists and turns around the corner that I don't think anybody could have possibly ever predicted. Um, we had heard, well, I, I, it gets complicated. I, I uh, became very interested in studying Emory Dreyfus muscular dystrophy. Um, I was invited out to Johns Hopkins to participate in a summer internship. And as I was there, they would bring genetic reports to my desk and I'd look at them and my job was to take this gene called nuclear lamin and map out all the different diseases that were being mapped to this gene. And in this incredibly tiny, tiny little gene, um, normally I was taught in genetics classes one disease per one gene. And that's how it had been for a, a while until we got to nuclear lamin. And it is a minefield of mutations. Tiny little gene, if you mess almost any letter up, there's a disease that goes with it. And at this point, it's at least 20 different genetic disorders in growing. So it's an incredibly important part of the cell because like we heard earlier, um, Watson and Crick um, discovered DNA in 1953. Um, the next really, really exciting development is that uh, the gene where I have a mutation is something called nuclear lamin. And it's liter literally what the body does to pull up the relevant genes it needs to make, what it needs to make and compress the things it doesn't. And what they find with diseases of nuclear lamin, um, you can kind of think of them as time clock disorders. Um, if you can't control what you're turning on and off when, then you uh, don't go through the process of um, cell development correctly. And the most dramatic um, case of this are children you've seen that have rapid aging disorders, um, such as Hutchinson, Guilford, progeria. Um, in those cases, they have a really um, serious mutation in nuclear lamin and they can't control the process, and then you see the most dramatic effects. But many other diseases um, of nuclear lamin affect some form of cell development, and in my case, it's affecting muscle development and fat development. So no one had really ever listened to me talk about fat until 
you know, I saw this paper and made the connections, but I was told, no, 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 that's something totally different. Well, as we go ahead with um, some of the slides, we found that there's an Olympic runner, and something really intriguing about this runner, she has, just like me and the rest of my family, not enough fat, especially if you look below the bust line, um, and lower on a woman, arms and legs in particular, abdomen. Um, she has a lot of questions, you know, because her veins are prominent, and when I started putting all the pieces together, I realized, could it possibly be that we were born with the same genetic disorder? Um, the difficulty, I talked with my local doctor, and he said that the trouble with this is that um, it was a really rare disease, one in a million people, that has this mutation of the steroid receptor, and, um, but we really were convinced that this was connected. The enormous problem, I said, well, let's call our agent, let's get in touch, let's see if we have similar genetics. Um, a doctor can't do that because that violates the HIPAA privacy rule. So we were in kind of a big mess. And one day by chance, I saw um, a journalist named David Epstein, and he was um, presenting on Good Morning America about a book he'd written called The Sports Gene and looking at Olympic athletes to see do they possibly have genetic mutations that either all or in part can explain the person's genetic ability um, in athletics. So um, I sent a lot of things to David. I sent more pictures, more ideas, more emails. We spent a lot of time talking to each other. And um, eventually, after about a year, he got brave enough, I got brave enough to ask if he'd contact um, Priscilla's agent, and he did. So I met Priscilla in Toronto, Canada. And as soon as we met, we started talking and realized we had so many things in common, different, uh, really specific symptoms. You know, I knew this must be connected. And um, so we'll go ahead a few more slides because I think I'm running short on time. Um, but it's a staggering situation to think, could these two people have a mutation in the same gene? We did have genetic testing, and I came about as close as you could, same gene, almost identical place, but in her body, um, this mutation of the steroid signal is causing her body to have an anabolic reaction, and she's extremely muscular, one of the most talented people in the world. But in my case, unfortunately, it's going the other way. Um, but the exciting thing is that, you know, I think a lot of scientists are scared. Where is this going? What happens if we pair up the really strong and someone who's weak? You know, and the exciting thing is we got to be friends, you know, and it could work out. And just to leave you <laughs> closing on NPR, just this past Monday, they were um, exploring a story about people with what they call superhero DNA, where they found, um, especially from samples people turned in for 23andMe, that um, out of 500,000 samples, they found about 13 <coughs> people who should have a dramatic uh, genetic disorder that do not develop that. Trouble is they did get release form signed for all these people so they cannot go back and find them, um, which is an enormous problem they would love to know. Um, but I just wanted to leave you with what I've shared in my talk, the two people that actually found each other and brought their identities out to everybody in the world. So, thank you.